Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host Michael on a Thursday, joined by Father Deacon Anthony Dragani. We are talking about John Paul II, 1986 Assisi World Prayer Meeting. Um, that comes up quite frequently whenever people accuse the Pope of idolatry, in fact. And so one of the things that comes up a lot is the Pachamama event, which Father Dragani about a month ago. Uh, did a video here on this channel on that subject, uh, walked through the ceremony play by play and explained to us what happened in the ceremony and weighs in for us on whether or not Pope Francis is guilty of idolatry. Go and check out the video if you haven't already. I'll put it in the show notes. But for this one, we're talking about John Paul II, 1986. This was kind of your Pachamama controversy before there ever was one, right? In 1986. Welcome back to the show, Father Deacon. How are you? Terrific, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to have you. Excited about this one. And by the way, we are also going to be doing a video next month on the Canada visit of Pope Francis and walking through a ceremony that he was involved in there as well. So y'all look for it. By the way, uh, I do want to mention to y'all the book that I just put out, Church Crisis. It's a free ebook. You can see it right there on the screen. Don't mean to cover you up, Father Dragani, but <laughs> That's how the overlay is right now. But there it is Church Chaos Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. It's a free ebook. If you're confused about the crisis in the Catholic Church right now, you don't know what to do, or it's preventing you from converting to Catholicism, or you're thinking about leaving, read that book. Like I said, it's free. Go to reasonandtheology.com. That's the website here. And once you go there, you'll see a pop up for it. Just simply click on it. And you'll put in your email and it will give you the PDF right then and there. And so certainly check it out if you're confused. Um, but OK, maybe, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about this event in 1986. Maybe set the stage for us. Certainly. So the key thing to remember here is what was going on in the world at the time. This was the height of the Cold War. And in Europe, especially, there was a lot of fear that nuclear war was right around the corner. Uh, you know, annihilation of humanity. That was the fear. And at the same time, we saw a major rise in secularism. And one of the reasons for that was that there is a narrative being spun that religion leads to warfare and violence. That was one of the main uh, talking points of the communists, for example, that so many wars are fought over religion that society would be a much better place if there was no religion. Uh, you know, a good example of this is the song Imagine by John Lennon. You know, imagine no religion, this peaceful, perfect All world. Right. All right. So that was the narrative. The world was afraid. Nuclear war seemed imminent. And religion was being spun as being the a tool of violence and something that leads to more warfare and more violence. And Pope John Paul II really wanted to kind of turn this narrative on its head. So we felt, first of all, it was really important that there be some sort of major action towards world peace. And he thought that religion could be used as a vehicle to promote this. So he had this idea of having uh, different religious leaders from around the world come together, and he chose the place to be Assisi in Italy, the home of St. Francis. And it's because St. Francis has been known historically as the man of peace. Uh, you know, peace was something that was very central to him. Plus, he also was known for, you know, having dialogues with the, uh, you know, different leaders from other faiths. You know, for example, he had a long dialogue with a Muslim leader in uh, Egypt. So this seemed like the, the ideal place to do it in the shadow of Francis of Assisi and not in Rome. Uh, he didn't want it to be done in Rome because, number one, if it was done in Rome, it, it wouldn't be like a level playing field, so to speak. Uh, World leaders going to Rome is a little different than the meeting together on a more neutral territory. Even though Assisi wasn't neutral territory, it was a different message than meeting up in Rome. So that was his goal, to, to pray for world peace, and to show the world that religion could be a tool for peace rather than something that leads to more warfare and violence. That was what he wanted to have happen. Um, so like I said, religious leaders from around the world were invited to this. Uh, simultaneously, a number of governments around the world uh, declared there would be no fighting that day. So this was a request that the Holy Father made that there be a general ceasefire. 
you know, of violence around the world. And a number of places, hotspots where there was violence declared there would be no fighting that day. Although a few of them ended up breaking that, uh, breaking that. But the other thing that Pope John Paul II was concerned about, he didn't want to give the impression of there being religious indifferentism. You know, the idea that all religions are the same, they're all equal. And that, by the way, was an idea that was getting a lot of traction, especially in, uh, you know, in, in anthropology and in some religious studies disciplines. That was around the time also when uh, Joseph Campbell and his books were very popular, The Power of Myth. And there's a lot of positive stuff in Joseph Campbell. I mean, there's some real insights in there. But at the same time, Joseph Campbell has this tendency to claim that all religions are saying the same thing. He looks at commonalities between them and argues they're all really the same. And we know as Christians that it cannot be true because if every religion is equally true, well, they all have contradictory beliefs, so that means that nothing is true, right? So Pope John Paul II wanted to avoid that. So he purposely planned the event and, and framed it like this. It was not religions of the world coming together to pray. No, that was not the idea. It was religions of the world being together to pray. Mm -hmm. So they weren't praying together, but they were being together to pray. That was mm -hmm. the idea. So there'd be no prayer in common, but rather they'd meet up and then they would go to separate locations. And there in these separate locations, they would um, do prayers according to their own tradition. So that was the plan. That was the idea. And uh, in, in a little while, I'll show you a video of how this actually kind of unfolded and uh, hit upon some of the controversies that arose from it. But that was the intention. And I think it was a good intention to show that religion can be a vehicle for peace and that, you know, praying for peace is a positive thing. I get the intention there. Here's some concerns that I have with that. Since some of these religions are calling on false gods, which according to scripture are demons, would this not be John Paul II inviting them to call on demons since he knows that they're not going to be calling on the one true God? So he was inviting them to pray. He was inviting them to pray however was comfortable to them. Uh, but that really isn't the same as explicitly inviting them to call upon false gods. Um, prayer is something innate in human beings. There's something in us that longs for something greater than ourselves. And that's because every human being, whether they acknowledge it or not, is made in the image and likeness of God. And there's something in us that aspires towards, uh, aspires towards, you know, connecting with this God. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the true religion of Christianity isn't embraced or known everywhere, but people still pray because that's something that's inherent inside of us. So inviting somebody to pray, um, what it's doing is respecting their dignity as people and respecting that they're doing something that's kind of programmed into us. You know, We're all meant to be religious beings one way or the other. Even atheists that I know of, some atheists become uh, almost religious in their zeal for atheism. So calling upon people to pray, something that's inherent upon us, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And again, he wasn't inviting them to specifically pray to false gods, but to pray, however they feel comfortable. Yeah, and, and I get that, but it's kind of like a near occasion. If you know that they are going to be doing this, should you invite them? It's it's like for somebody that you know struggles with alcohol, you know, could you invite them over to a bar? Yeah, you, you could, you know, maybe you could just have pretzels and water or something, but you know, it's a near occasion of sin and they're probably going to sin in that occasion. Well, the, the other, the other point of it though, is this, a non-Christian praying isn't necessarily sinful to them. It isn't necessarily because again, there's something inside of us that has this impulse to pray, to connect with a higher power. And if they're not connecting with the true God, they're still going to try and reach out to something. That's something programmed within us, and that's not necessarily sinful for them. Keep in mind that no religions were invited uh, that explicitly pray to dark forces. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Satanists were not invited to participate. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, religions that are known for human sacrifice or known for a dark history of, of you know, of evil acts, none of those were invited. Now, the religions that were invited were ones that are generally seen as being pretty benign and that which we may have some level of commonality with to one degree or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would argue personally that not all religions are 
demonic or false. Um, I tend to believe, this is just my personal belief, that any religion that has existed for thousands of years and sustained human civilizations probably has some core of truth to it. There's something to it that sustains people, some truth at the very core. Now, there may be many falsehoods mixed in. That is mm -hmm. possible. Sure. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there may be some truth at the heart of it. Sure. Um, you did a great video a week or so ago, Michael, in which you talked about St. Justin Martyr mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what he called the seeds of the Logos. Yeah. You know, many cultures, uh, many religions have these seeds of God, seeds of Logos in them. Now, they need to be refined. They need to, need to be drawn out and Christianized, but they're seeds of truth all over the place. And, and why that is, that, that's an interesting discussion in and of itself. Mm -hmm. There was a theory, it's not very popular anymore, but there's something to be said for it. There's a theory that originally, if you go back to the very beginnings of human civilization, people were originally monotheists and they had the original religion of Adam. And then as time went on, as hum humanity became separated, um, it devolved into other things such as polytheism and animism and whatnot. Uh, that was a theory that you find some of the church fathers espousing. And, um, you know, there were some great writers, Catholic writers over the centuries who advocated this, mm. that there was originally one true religion, and then it kind of devolved into all the different varieties. But that also explains then why there are commonalities between different religions, why you find the same myths, the same stories in different religions, because they all come from the same true religion. Mm -hmm. Now, today, this theory is not very popular. And I think that's because we have a tendency to look at religion through the lens of evolution. You know, we we see things through the lens of evolution. So um, it looks to us like religions begin one way and evolve into being another, right? The monotheism is a later development, but it's very possible it's actually the other way around. Um, but at any rate, uh, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that every being being prayed to at these events is necessarily a demon. It's possible that they're praying towards what they conceive God to be, and it's an erroneous conception but still, if these prayers are being sent out to a higher power who they believe to be good, and it's in a spirit of good intentions, um, it's very possible that God hears their prayers. It's very possible. Now, that does not mean that we should not preach the gospel. We must always preach the gospel. We have a commandment to go out and baptize all the nations. That's essential. But at the same time, we shouldn't assume that everything non-Christian is automatically evil or demonic. Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. And, I, you know, I read the speeches that John Paul II had with the event, and he does proclaim Christ to them. And so at the end of the event, he makes it known. He makes it very clear. And so I'll put does, that out, does, yeah. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. So sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, you have this video for us. Um, can you tell us who are maybe some of the participants? I know there are Orthodox representatives there, right. uh, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, I think. Oh, Yeah, there were, um, I think, I think there were 12 major religions represented, but within them, there were like subgroups, like different denominations within Christianity. I know some of the main ones present, um, there was the Patriarch of Moscow at the time. I think either the Romanian or Bulgarian, one or the other, one, the Romanian or Bulgarian Patriarch was there. The video, I think, identifies who's who. Uh, I also know that there was a representative of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Yeah. The Patriarch himself could not be there, but he sent a representative. And then uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury mm -hmm. was there representing the Anglican Communion. Mm -hmm. And then there was also um, a Jewish representatives, like the chief rabbi of Rome was there. Mm -hmm. uh, representing Hinduism, um, I believe it was the, the nephew of Gandhi and then another uh, Hindu representatives. There were some Zoroastrians present. There were Native Americans present as well, two Native Americans. Uh, Muslims were present. And of course, Buddhists were present, led by the uh, Dalai Lama. And we'll get to that in a little bit later, because that became one of the main scandals of the event is what happened there. But uh, mm -hmm. Buddhists were present. Yeah, yeah, we, we certainly need to touch on that issue. So, OK, well, yeah, if you want, let's go ahead and uh, bring up the video. Let's take a look. Give us a play by play. Sure, sure. I'm going to load it up right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, I, uh, I, I said in the chat there. Uh, the the patriarch of constant oh, I'm sorry of Russia was there. There goes Vigano's third Rome theory. The third Rome, <laughs> yes. He also was defiled. 
if y'all don't know, go and watch the video I did earlier today where Vigano is pushing uh, Russia really hard. So Okay, I loaded the video in. How do I make it uh -huh. play? Okay. There it is. Great. Uh -huh. And I have control of it now. So yep. Yep. let me give a little context for this, first of all. Um, I hunted and I searched. There is not a lot of video footage of this day available that's readily easy to find. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for something neutral that perhaps gave a Catholic perspective or no commentary at all. I couldn't find anything. All I could find is this video that you actually sent to me, Michael. Mm -hmm. And it's a video that's very polemical against the event. Sure. And I, I was able to track down where the video came from. At first, I thought it was like maybe the SSPX or, uh, you know, a traditional Catholic group. But actually, this video was put together um, by an old calendarist Orthodox group. Right. <laughs> you know, with, yeah, certainly interesting. And the first time I came across this was 2006. I was brand new Christian, just had really, uh, you know, converted. And, you know, I'd been exposed to Christianity before that. But for those of y'all who know my testimony in 2006, I really had a profound conversion. And the group that converted me, um, immediately showed me a video of Dave Hunt, who is a Protestant guy. Um, I think the Brethren is who he was part of. Um, Dave Hunt's video, A Woman Who Rides the Beast. And it had video footage of John Paul II there. And they're saying, see, you know, one world religion, idolatry, the book of Revelation, you know, being fulfilled in our midst and all kinds of stuff. So um, that I, I have seen it there. And then the other footage is, like you said, from the uh, old calendarist Orthodox. Other than that, I've never really found any other footage of the event. I've, I've never actually seen substantial footage from a Catholic perspective. Yeah. I'm thinking what happened is there was there were news stories at the time, <clears throat> and the footage was captured by certain people, but probably the people who were most interested in holding on to it were the ones who wanted to use it as proof of the evils of Catholicism. Mm-hmm. Or who wanted to, to uh, you know, go against Pope John Paul II? So they seem to be the ones who preserve the footage in a way that you can find it online, at least. I imagine somewhere there's there's you know, neutral Catholic footage, but uh, this particular footage was compiled by this Orthodox Old Calendarist group who called themselves the Genuine Orthodox Church of Greece, uh -huh. otherwise known as the Synod and Resistance. So. Uh -huh. Their interest here isn't just showing how evil Catholicism is, but their interest is also showing that the Orthodox participants are heretics. And and that's what's curious, because any time Assisi is brought up, I'll always have some Orthodox who jumps in and says, this is why you need to convert to Orthodoxy. And then I point out, but wait, you have Orthodox who are present there. And so the, the point is, this is exactly how people end up leaving Catholicism, going to orthodoxy. Then they find out in orthodoxy that a lot of the criticisms they had of Catholicism then apply to the orthodox. So then they find themselves in these kind of set of a contest groups of, of, of orthodoxy. They're not the same as set of a contest, but it's right. kind of those fringe outside of world orthodoxy and canonical orthodoxy groups. Exactly. So for those who aren't familiar with the orthodox world, the, the genuine orthodox church of Greece, is not the genuine Orthodox Church of Greece, right? This is a <laughs> kind of like a like a you know SSPX or even more mm -hmm. schismatic group than that within yeah. Orthodoxy. Yeah, it's a breakaway group. Mm -hmm. So this video is from them, and I'm going to play it with the commentary because the commentary is extremely negative and biased, but it, it reflects the the common things you're going to see about this online. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let the commentary play, and I'm going to offer my thoughts on it as well. Then perfect. All right, so I'm just going to jump right into it. So, of course, this is on October 27th of 1986 in Assisi, Italy. At the initiative of Pope John Paul II, on October the 27th, 1986, in Assisi, Italy, the first meeting of religions for the peace of the world took place. One hundred and fifty representatives from twelve religions took part. Also present were the four great worldwide interreligious organizations. 
the Interreligious Association for Religious Freedom, the World Congress of Faith, the Temple of Understanding, and the World Conference on Religion. And that, by the way, um, is the Dalai Lama. For those who didn't know who he is, that's the 14th Dalai Lama. And interestingly enough, he and Pope John Paul II had a real connection. And part of it is both of them lived under extremely oppressive communist regimes that try to stamp out religion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Pope John Paul II was under the thumb of the Soviet Union, and he he dealt with them and their their ire on many occasions. And the Dalai Lama was uh, almost assassinated multiple times by the Chinese communists, and he had to escape Tibet to India for his own safety. And the two of them together kind of had a had a front, a united front in some ways, where they were trying to warn the world about the evils of communism and the destruction of, of freedom and of religion. So there's a connection there between them. People should be aware of that. Mm. And, and peace. Present were Buddhists, Muslims, Aboriginals from Africa and America, Zoroastrians, Sikhs, Hindus, and Shintoists. Also present was Elio Toa, chief rabbi of the Central Synagogue of Rome, which the Pope had visited a few months previously. Christians of almost all confessions were represented. The World Council of Churches, Nestorians, Non-Chalcedonians, Copts, Armenians, Malabaris, Roman Catholics, Old Catholics, Anglicans, Lutherans. There were delegates from the Orthodox churches of Finland and Czechoslovakia, the Patriarchate of Bulgaria, the Patriarchate of Romania, the Patriarchate of Georgia, the Patriarchate of Moscow, and the Patriarchate of Antioch. So we can see right there that there was quite a representation of Eastern Orthodoxy there. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I want to be clear. I, I'm not sure necessarily who the delegates were. Mm -hmm. Some of them may have been patriarchs. Perhaps they were not. I had a hard time finding exact information on that. So either they're patriarchs or they were uh, like archbishops or somebody representing the patriarch. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell. And the pictures are sufficiently blurry. It's hard to identify faces. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that was actually the patriarch of Moscow or one of his representatives. Mm -hmm. Um but my guess is it may have been the patriarch. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, there was quite an orthodox uh, you know, contingent there. Yeah, certainly. A special place next to the Pope was occupied by Archbishop Runcie, the presiding bishop of the Anglicans, and Archbishop Methodius of Theatera, the representative of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. The churches of Alexandria and Jerusalem declared their spiritual ascent with messages.
the Pope was the only speaker. And um, this is the, the only speaker at this point. <laughs> and is, of course, Pope John Paul II. <laughs> but what's interesting is the content of the speech, which is about peace and how peace comes through Jesus Christ. <laughs> he, he made a, bit, a major point of that, that, that Jesus Christ is the bringer of peace. So he in no way tried to water down his Christian theology. He in no way tried to say that all religions are equal. Yeah. He gave a very strong Christian witness here, very strong Christian witness. And by the way, you know, this narrative that people spin that Pope John Paul II had this event to show that all religions are equal and that you don't have to be Christian or whatnot, that doesn't line up with his life because this is a man who spent his life traveling around the globe preaching about Jesus Christ to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was an epic missionary, epic missionary in that sense. So to think you'd have an event where he like downplayed Jesus or the centrality of Christ uh, doesn't really line up with who he is. And this or speech, what, it, yeah, yeah, or what he says in the speech. So the speech is is a witness to Jesus. Mm -hmm. In his address, he equated the prayer of Christians to the true and only God with the prayer of all other religions. Completely false, by the way. If you read the text of the speech, that is not at all what happened. Right. But again, this is commentary with an agenda. Right, yeah. But I'd urge anyone to actually look up the speech. You can find the text online. It's very Christ-centric. Yeah, I'll put links to those in the description. I, I read them beforehand, and yeah, that you're, you're absolutely right. That That's abundantly false, what we just heard. Yeah, that, that's the commentary at work. <laughs> spin yep peace he emphasized is a fruit of prayer which in the various religions expresses a relationship with a supreme power Pope's speech was followed by silent prayer, joint prayer. No, it was not joint prayer. That was that was key. There was a moment of silence. People could pray if they wished, but Pope John Paul II was very clear there was no joint prayer. People were mm -hmm. praying separately. Mm -hmm. of other religions were assigned Christian churches to perform their worship services. Okay, this is where the uh, the, the scandal comes in. Mm -hmm. So the organizers of the event uh, made, in my opinion, a bad judgment call. Mm -hmm. And here is, I think, their, their number one mistake. So the plan was that these world leaders of different religions would gather together. There'd be a, a you know, a, a speech by Pope John Paul II, mm -hmm. and then they'd go into separate locations to pray. And some of these separate locations were pretty innocuous. Like uh, some people were put in like in a town hall, others in a room in a monastery or a room in a convent, you know, a large area. But for some reason, uh, some of the groups were given churches to pray in. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was uh, a bad judgment call on the part of the organizers. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, churches are holy places, they're consecrated for a purpose. And having another religion conduct their service in a consecrated Christian church, I think uh, it's not supposed to happen like that. And I think as well that it sends the wrong message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm pretty positive Pope John Paul II did not make this judgment call himself. He left this in the hands of the organizers. And this was organized by a few groups. Uh, one of the main ones, of course, was the... Um, the Vatican's, uh, was it the Council for Interreligious Dialogue? Mm -hmm. And there was also a group called the Saint, I want to say it's Egido. It's a different word for St. Giles uh, Society. Uh, they were one of the main promoters of this as well. And they had a role in organizing it, as did the Franciscans in Assisi. So for whatever reason, somebody made the call to 
allow non-Christian groups to use Christian churches to pray in, uh, which again, I think that's what what led to many of the problems that came out of this. And we're going to see here the main one, and uh, we'll listen to his commentary, and then I'll give more background on what really happened. Okay. And to pray for peace. Buddhists prayed in the parish church of St. Peter. They placed a small statue of Buddha on the altar. And who are they praying to, these Buddhists? Okay, so a, a few points here. Uh, what he said actually was not completely correct. It was actually worse. They placed the statue of Buddha on top of the tabernacle. Mm-hmm. Now, let me first explain how that happened. Mm -hmm. So they were given this church to pray in, but it wasn't clear to them what the limits of their activity could be. Right. And without ill intention, they put a statue of Buddha on top of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Now, was the Eucharist in the tabernacle? I, I can't I can't say. I would assume it might have might have been. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a a practice you find in many places where uh, in Europe, for example, if they're having a concert in a, a church, they usually will take the Blessed Sacrament out of the tabernacle. Not always, but often that happens. I don't know if that happened here or not. I don't know. Yeah. And I couldn't, I, I searched and I searched, I couldn't find anything on one way or the other. But either way, placing a statue of Buddha on top of the tabernacle is not wise by any stretch of the imagination. Sure. That being said, Nobody approved this. Uh, none of the Catholic organizers thought this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I've read multiple accounts of, of what took place here. Most of them give the same narrative, which was um, the, the, the Buddhists took a statue of Buddha, put it on the tabernacle, and began praying. And as soon as that happened, one of the Franciscan priests there walked up to them, explained that this was inappropriate, and the Dalai Lama apologized and had it removed. It, it was only there a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. Most accounts say that. Now, there's another account going around that's very different that says that a Benedictine priest saw this, went up and said this needed to stop. And then the organizers uh, had the police violently remove him from the premises. Now, that narrative seems to be uh, put forth on sites that are very anti-Pope John Paul II or very anti-Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I'm not sure I believe that, that story. Uh, the mm -hmm. one that makes more sense is the one that I've seen multiple places where as soon as this was witnessed, um, the Buddhists were told this was inappropriate, they apologized, and they took it off. Um, but you asked, who are they praying to? Who are they Correct. praying to? Right. All right. So he here's, let me give you, um, let me give you some context here. So very often when, when Catholics uh, pray, sometimes they'll use the language, I'm praying to Mary, or I'm praying to St. Anthony. And Protestant Christians will hear that and think, oh my gosh, they're worshiping Mary or they're worshiping St. Anthony. And that's because the word pray has come to take on different connotations in different religious traditions. Um, in Catholicism, we tend to use the older meaning of the word pray, which means simply to ask. So typically when a Catholic is praying, that means they're asking, they're, inter they're asking intercession from a saint. Uh, it doesn't always imply worship. But in Protestantism, the word pray has come to apply worship, which creates a lot of a lot of confusion, right? So I want to be clear here. There may be some exceptions, but in general, Buddhists do not worship Buddha. Buddhists do not worship Buddha. As a matter of fact, they look to Buddha more like we look at a saint. Mm -hmm. They see him as an example. They see him as a model worth following, but they do not worship him as a god. As a matter of fact, on the question of god of an all-powerful god buddhism is somewhat agnostic they don't claim to have an answer on that uh, there may be a god there may not be a god they don't know they don't claim to know um, so they do not worship buddha as a god so some might describe that as an idol of buddha i think a more accurate uh, description would be maybe uh, you know a religious statue kind of like mm -hmm. a statue of mary or a statue of another saint that's how they would view it. They don't worship Buddha as a god. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that somebody is going to say in the comments, ah, but these were Tibetan Buddhists. Tibetan Buddhists are polytheistic. They worship gods. 
that is not entirely accurate. That's not, not entirely accurate. The reason people say that is if you look at the literature of the Tibetan Buddhists, mm -hmm. they sometimes use language to talk about different spiritual beings. And one of the words they use is often translated as gods. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they're really talking about are good spirits, and they also talk about devils, which are bad spirits. So mm -hmm. they're talking more along the lines of angels and demons. But the word they use in the Tibetan literature is oftentimes translated as gods. So people believe they're polytheistic. But if you really delve into the heart of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, like other Buddhists, they do not worship these as gods in the same sense that Christians worship God. Rather, they venerate uh, holy people and they venerate angelic beings they see as protectors. Mm -hmm. So who are they praying to? Well, if you would ask the Dalai Lama, he, was, he would say he's praying to Buddha. Mm -hmm. But what he's doing is more akin to asking intercession than worshiping. Mm -hmm. Now, again, yeah. you can probably find some literature somewhere that translates what they're doing as worship. I mean, you can find all kinds of translations of different things. But, you know, if you really get into the heart of Tibetan Buddhism, what's taking place here is more akin to a Catholic venerating Mary than it is to a Catholic worshiping God. Or asking Mary for her intercession. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But at any rate, what happened here was a terrible mistake, right? Mm -hmm. There should have been something put in place to stop this. Um, it, it was an oversight by the organizers, but again, it was a very, it, it was something that was only up long enough to get some good video footage of it mm -hmm. for purposes like this. Um, how long it was there, I can't find an exact account of how many minutes or hours, but most of the accounts I read said it was relatively quickly handled. Now, the Hindus were also present. Do they have any details of what was going on with them? Because they are, in fact worshiping other deities right right the hindus are in fact worshiping other deities mm -hmm. um although that's a whole other story if you go deep enough into hinduism they're not actually polytheists they're pantheists mm -hmm. but what they're doing they would describe as worshiping other deities for sure yes mm -hmm. um were they given a church were they given another location i could find no details on that mm -hmm. so i'm not sure where they were at maybe the video shows them but i don't recall it doing that mm -hmm. um but um Yes, I think that it would be fair to say the Hindus were worshiping other deities. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what the problem is, to provide them a place to worship their false gods. That That's where I think there's an issue. Right, right. Um, now, again, them worshiping the false gods, is it possible that without realizing it, they're giving worship to the true God? Maybe, maybe. But again... Uh, I, I don't think it'd be appropriate to give them a Christian prayer space for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And even, even if they are like, let's say that God hears their prayers because they somehow have invincible ignorance. It's not through their worship that any of this is answered. It's despite their worship and their ignorance that God would answer their prayer. It would be despite the false elements of their worship from a Christian mm -hmm. perspective, you know, from the Christian perspective, there are false elements to their worship but the, the fact that they're they're reaching out towards a creator of some kind who they believe is benevolent and who has a power greater than them, to the extent that they're doing that, um, uh, perhaps there's some good that can come from that. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll, I'll continue with a bit more of the video. Okay. The Hindus assembled in the church of Santa Maria Maggiore, so question answered, the Hindus were also given a church as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, not a wise decision by any means. Sitting around right. the sanctuary, they invoked the whole succession of their gods. The Muslims gathered in the monastery of St. Anthony. The aboriginals of Africa prayed in the church of St. Gregory and prepared their peace pipes inside the sanctuary. The Shintoists were assigned to the Benedictine monastery, has ended up in joint prayers with heathens to the... Okay, so the fact, again, that these religions were given churches to use, I think, was highly problematic, but much better if they were given uh, spaces without religious um, consecration, places that were non-religious would have been made a whole lot more sense. Again, I don't think the Pope John Paul II personally signed off on that. I think the organizers had a major oversight there. Mm -hmm. 
And that gave rise to these, these images, which are very rightfully so scandalous to a lot of people. So here is when it's all over, when they're done doing their individual prayers, they all come together. Now, if you listen to the commentary, he says this is when the heathens come together to you know, have joint prayer and apostasy. But actually, that it, there wasn't joint prayer. What happened was they all came together at the end, and then each representative was allowed to come up and make a statement or say a prayer themselves in their tradition. Uh, but it wasn't people praying together. They weren't People weren't joining in the prayers. They had a chance to give a statement or to make a prayer. So it wasn't like, you know, all the Christian representatives were joining in the Muslim prayer or the, you know, the the Pope was praying along with the Hindus, but rather people were given a chance to make a statement or say a prayer of their own tradition with others just listening respectfully. Supposed common father. We are in fact here together to pray and for no other reason than to pray. Where further, we wonder, will this journey of apostasy lead? And by the way, the uh, subheadings are very misleading. It says, you know, Muslim prayer service. It wasn't a Muslim prayer service. Like I said, each religion had a representative who came up who could either make a statement or say a prayer. It wasn't like a service taking place. Mm -hmm. In Assisi, the establishment of a World Council of Religions was proposed analogous to the United Nations organization, an organization. Okay, first of all, you notice they're, they're trying to um, get into one world government stuff here, right? Mm -hmm. as, um, as some of the more extreme fringe Christian groups are opt, apt to doing. Uh, but this picture here and, and pictures like this, I do think are potentially problematic. Because again, Pope John Paul II wanted to be very clear, very clear that that they were praying separately. They're coming together to pray, but not pray together. Uh, but what, what the most people saw was this photograph or photographs like this of, you know, Christian bishops right next to Hindu and Muslim and, you know, um, Buddhist leaders. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it could strongly give the impression that all these religions are equal. And as Catholic Christians, we do not believe that obviously. Um, so images like this, I think, could very easily be taken out of context and used to present a picture of all religions being equal and ultimately leading to religious relativism or indifferentism. Mm -hmm. So doesn't that kind of lend itself to the criticism that um, for sure this is, this is bad optics um, yes. and when it's not accompanied by proper explanation, it misleads people or certainly can lend itself to people being misled. Absolutely. Yes. And that, mm -hmm. that would be, I think a very valid criticism, mm -hmm. a very valid criticism in spite of the best intentions of the Holy father. Um, mm -hmm. as we saw this event gave a lot of images that could be taken out of context and used, mm -hmm. uh, for purposes of sowing division. So yeah. for example, uh, you know, when, um, the SSPX did their formal break in 1988. This was one of the main reasons they cited for it. Mm -hmm. Was this event? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, even today, if you look up a CC 1986, of the websites that come up, eight out of ten are from e extreme fringe groups using mm -hmm. it as evidence of the evils of Pope John Paul II, or mm -hmm. to show the Catholic Church is an apostasy. Yeah, like I said, that's what I first encountered when I first learned about Catholicism. This is what I was shown. And so, you know, that's why I think, you know, John Paul II had really good intentions here. 
But I think at the end of the day, this is incredibly inappropriate and imprudent because it's going to give the, a false impression to people. It could, it could. I mean, it, it's hard to say. Um, is there anything inherently wrong with Christians from different traditions coming to get together with, with people from other religions and talking and having dialogue? I mean, is there anything inherently wrong with, you know, Christian leaders of different denominations coming together with Buddhist leaders and Muslim leaders and Jewish leaders and Hindu leaders and having discussions. I don't think there is, and I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with them being in the same room. Um, I myself have participated in panel discussions uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, I've been on panels before with Muslim Buddhist and uh, sure. Buddhist leaders and rabbis. I've been, sure, sure. so there, there are photos of me sitting next to them. Right. Um, yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're all on an equal playing field. It means we're having a discussion. So yeah. I, I think these kind of images, they can be used badly. Um, but at the same time, I would hope that people would would try and approach them with some common sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Pope John Paul II, again, is a man who spent his life preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. One would assume that he isn't like taking off his Christian hat for one day and becoming, you know, uh, a rel religious relativist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I agree with you as far as discussions. Yeah. There, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. My, my criticism as far as what is inappropriate and, and certainly imprudent um, is whenever you have the element of prayer involved, even though it's not joint prayer. Um, that's when it's like, okay, I think that since this isn't being properly explained, people are going to get a certain impression. And so this shouldn't be done. For that reason right and in this situation here where they're all sitting down and one at a time they're getting up and making a statement or saying a prayer could very easily be misinterpreted as joint prayer that exactly exactly that yeah. that's why i say that in, in my opinion at the end of the day this shouldn't have taken place or i, I don't think it it was necessarily bad but i think there should have been much different planning I think that they should have come together and just had discussions. Leave the whole prayer stuff out of out of it. Mm -hmm. Let's just come together and let's talk about what we can do to work towards peace. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, there's a, there's an argument to be made for leaving the prayer out of it. But I think Pope John Paul II, what he was hoping for was that a demonstration that prayer could be a vehicle of peace. So I think for him, the prayer was important to what he was trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Whether that was prudent or not, that was a different question. Right. Right. Which would be distinguished by its moral influence in matters of world peace and justice. All right, from that point on, it wraps up. What happens is there are a few more people giving prayers or making statements, and then it's over. And then the video goes into other things later on that they see as other apostasies, so there's no point in continuing. So I'll just stop it here at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I end it? Oh, uh, let's see. I can do it on my end there. There Great. we go. Great. Yeah. So th after that, what ended up happening was um, the different religious leaders got together at the monastery, and they had a like a dinner mm -hmm. and they served food that was kind of non-offensive to the different groups present. So like vegan type stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, pretty much the day. John Paul II also gave a closing speech though, where, where he proclaimed Christ to them. Uh, he, did. he did. He did. He did. One of the state with the statements and the prayers he, he gave his own as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the way, y'all can put some questions there in the chat. Make sure to put them to at reason and theology. So here's another one of the criticisms in addition to what, what I just mentioned there about, um, about the optics of it. Um, another criticism would be 
could we see the apostles doing such things? Um, is that even an appropriate question? And if so, again, could we see that? Could we see them maybe saying those who venerate or worship Baal uh, have them come and pray and maybe God will, the one true God will hear them uh, if they're invincibly ignorant or something like that. That's where the criticism starts to come in. You know, can we see the apostles do this and with the situation in their day? What, what's your take on that? Yeah. Um, the apostles with the situation in their day, um, I can't see them doing that. But again, too, we have to consider um, the circumstances were different then as well. So if you had religions that were actively, you know, um, actively engaged in activities that were abhorrent uh, to the very essence of the Christian faith. So for mm -hmm. example, like the Greco-Roman religion, it was practicing human sacrifice, even then, even then, in the time of the apostles. People don't realize this, but the gladiatorial games that took place across the Roman Empire, they weren't just about entertainment. They actually were human sacrifices. Uh, the death of the gladiators were offerings to the gods. Mm. So at that point, <clears throat> the religions they were surrounded with were engaged in things that were extremely uh, abhorrent at their very core. Um the situation in 1986 was different. The big threat to them was secularism, this mm -hmm. idea of a world without religion. That was seen as the threat. And the sense was that those who believe in a higher power, a God, that's something we have in common that we can work with and we should build on that. That was the sense that there was something uniting them, which was belief, belief in a God or a higher power of some kind. That was seen as a unifying force to be celebrated. Uh, and again, none of the religions invited were at that time engaged in anything remotely similar to human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Here's one from uh, Declan. He says, shouldn't it be taken as granted that a Catholic and Sunni Muslim praying side by side don't think they are giving holy equal prayer to God? Optics is one thing, but common sense for the viewer is also a factor, in my opinion. Any comments on that one? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the, what the question was. I think the what standard. they're... I think that they're saying that um, since you have Catholics praying here and then you have Sunni Muslims praying after that, it it it's it should be taken for granted that they're not saying that they're equal to one another. Hmm. Uh, right. Yeah, we, this comes back to something we talked about with the, uh, you know, the whole Pachamama thing, mm -hmm. which is a hermeneutic of suspicion, mm -hmm. you know, versus a hermeneutic of charity. Uh, like I said in the other video, I think it's important to always give the best possible interpretation, mm -hmm. especially to someone that we we should assume has good intentions. Um, we shouldn't assume that the Pope, whoever the Pope is, is automatically looking to do the most nefarious thing imaginable. Sure. We should assume that the intentions are good and he's trying to do something positive. So if you look at this event with the hermeneutic of charity as opposed to a hermeneutic of suspicion, you begin with the, the assumption that Pope John Paul II is witnessing to Jesus Christ, because that's what he always did. Mm -hmm. You begin with the assumption that that they were not trying to present religions as being equal or being, uh, you know, all the same. That was never the, the interpretation that was meant to be taking place. So with a hermeneutic of charity, I think you'd come to the different conclusion than if you approach it with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Here's another one from Father John Brown. Uh, could this fall under the principle akin to St. Francis Xavier telling Buddhists to be better Buddhists so that they'd be more moral and better disposed to conversion to Christianity? That's a, a good question. I wasn't aware that St. Francis Xavier had actually done that. Uh, I hadn't heard about that before. Yeah, Father, maybe if you can email that to me with some more information, I'd, I'd like to take a look at that. I've heard of some similar things from Mother Teresa. But keep in mind, too, it, when he's talking to Buddhists, um, you know, Buddhists are open to the idea of a god, but they were not worshiping other gods either. So mm -hmm. if you look at the core of Buddhism, a lot of it is about letting go of worldly things, trying to put uh, the well-being of others ahead of your own desires, not being slaves to fleshly passions. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the things of the core of Buddhism are very similar to, to Christian asceticism. Mm. So being a good Buddhist could very well be preparation to be to being a great Christian. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly some points of commonality commonality there. I mean, there's there's certainly error as well, but um, there's some elements that we would have in common that I could see as being preparation for the gospel. Um, this is from the Logos Project. Does our secure neutral world attack the virtue of religion itself by burning it into a tolerated belief which can cause violence? I would remove the word tolerated. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say that our secular culture is tolerating religion less and less even, even today. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, yes, the secular world is trying to uh, take any credibility away from religion as presenting it as a force of violence. And I think even back in 1986, that was happening quite a bit. And that's what Pope John Paul II was trying to counter. Mm -hmm. But I would say the idea of religion being tolerated is becoming less and less of a thing even today, unfortunately. And that's why, you know, there are different responses to this. Mm -hmm. If if you get the sense that the secular world is trying to target religion or stamp out religion, there are two different ways to go. One way is to buckle down, grow stronger in our faith, and be a stronger witness to Christ in the face of persecution. And the other is to try and water down the religion to make the religion uh, appease the world, you know, to try and have the religion bend to what the world wants so we don't seem as offensive, so they'll tolerate us even more. Some churches have taken that approach. Um, and unfortunately, you know, some bishops in Germany are advocating that approach. Mm -hmm. But that rarely brings any kind of positive fruit. Usually it just delays a greater persecution down the road. This is from Patrick. What exactly would be the distinction between misleading people and scandal? Is it about the act being intrinsically evil or is it one's intention? Not assuming anything bad here. So misleading people and scandal, I would say scandal can be caused by people engaging in things that are meant to be positive. Mm -hmm. Whereas misleading people is purposely trying to give them the word bad information or trying to purposely entice them to have the worst possible interpretation. So um, looking at the video we just watched, you know, some things happened in the video that caused scandal, and I would say unintentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, it was un unintentional on the part of Pope John Paul II, unintentional on the part of the organizers, and even unintentional on the part of the non-Christian participants. The Dalai Lama didn't mean to create any scandal. He didn't mean to do any harm. He didn't. Um, so that was scandal caused by good intentions. I would say the narrator, the narrator who's trying to twist the events and, and, and make things out of what's happening, I would say he's the one who's misleading people. I mean, he was warping the words, the words of Pope John Paul II in his speech. Um, that's misleading. But at the same time, if we live our lives as Christians, it's very easy to cause scandal and we can't necessarily operate out of a fear of scandal. If you look at Jesus, things he did caused a lot of scandal. He went to the homes of tax collectors. He hung out with prostitutes. That caused a lot of scandal, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So causing scandal in and of itself isn't always necessarily a sign that you're on the wrong track. Yeah, that, that's a helpful point. Um before we shift gears to, to to some other aspects of John Paul II, there there is one that's kind of related. Uh, what was the deal with John Paul II drinking from a bowl? And it is portrayed as some kind of evil potion or him participating in some demonic religious activity. Uh, I'm not familiar with the image of him drinking from a bowl. What was that exactly? I don't recall either. Um, so yeah, that one I'm not sure about. It's probably possible he was at, in a different culture and they offered him a drink and they drank out of a bowl. I mean, that can happen. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency sometimes, especially on the part of traditional Christians, traditional Catholics, mm -hmm. to see anything that looks foreign and to assume that it's pagan mm -hmm. or assume that it's somehow demonic just because it looks foreign. Or very often, it's just a foreign element of another culture that's completely harmless or even positive. Yeah. I, I wonder if this has anything to do with like, the smudging ceremony wasn't he in a smudging ceremony or he something? was he was yeah. can you explain that briefly yeah you know a smudging ceremony there are different ways of doing it different native groups and different cultures handle it differently but it very often involves things such as perhaps burning some incense um, maybe it involves putting you know 
paint on a person's head or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Often it involves, you know, maybe, maybe burning a plant of some kind. Traditionally, smudging ceremonies were about driving away evil spirits, mm -hmm. um, but they're not inherently pagan. It's one of those things that can be brought into a culture and interpreted in a positive way. Mm -hmm. It's not much different than how, say, the ancient Romans would burn incense, right? They'd mm -hmm. burn incense to idols of Zeus, you know, or to the various gods and goddesses. And Christianity took that and, and Christianized it, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing about a smudging ceremony that's inherently pagan or non-Christian. It can very well be interpreted in a Christian context, just like incense is. Um, this is about the Orthodox. Was there a major Orthodox reaction to the involvement of the patriarchs in, in this on the same level as what Roman Catholic world manifested on the same time or since? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, in the Catholic world, we have our ultra, ultra, ultra traditionalists. And the Orthodox world has their ultra, ultra, ultra traditionalists, some of whom are schismatic, some of whom are not. The people who made the video that we just watched were definitely schismatic. Um so yeah, their reaction was about the same as the SSPX or the set of uncondest reaction. And thank you, Raul, for the uh, super chat there. Logos Project asks, might some of this also be an overly optimistic view of humanity? Well, that is possible. That is possible. So Pope John Paul II was a saint. I have no doubt about that. I have tremendous love for him. I think he was a great leader, a brilliant man. If you read through his books, man, he was a, a sharp thinker, probably one of the smartest popes in human history, I'd imagine. Um, but he was very optimistic. Whether he was right in that or not is up to up for debate, but he was very, very hopeful. He had a lot of hope. <clears throat> That's not necessarily a bad thing, but he was very hopeful. One of the things he believed, one of the things he thought was possible was that the millennium, you know, the, the, the turning from the 20th to the 21st century <clears throat> would usher in a new era of human peace. He had lived through World War II, then he saw the world ravaged by war and the Cold War. He was very hopeful that at the turn of the millennium, it'd be almost like a fresh start in some ways, so there would be peace. Um, and he was devastated when in 2001, he saw the footage of the World Trade Center because mm. he knew what that meant. He, he knew that meant more wars were coming. And that was a very painful thing for him to see uh, because he really thought a new era of peace could be around the corner. So he was very hopeful about humanity. But again, I wouldn't say that was a flaw. We need optimists. We need people who have hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mahovel, for the super chat. He says, and everyone comes to Pope who is regent of Christ and now to him. I'm not sure what the comment means, but I, I do appreciate it. There's another one here um, on the question of John Paul II and the uh, kissing of the Quran. Um, what about John Paul II kissing the Quran? Will we do another video on that um no let, let's go ahead and tackle it now yeah i i don't think you can make a whole video out of it because it's mm -hmm. it was such a um a quick brief thing mm -hmm. so the problem is there's no documentation as to what pope john paul ii thought when he did this mm -hmm. he just did it so what was he thinking and all we can do is speculate as to what may have been going through his mind and there are a few possibilities one possibility that that i thought was very likely, Pope John Paul II was receiving a delegation from Iraq. Mm -hmm. So delegates from Iraq came to see him. And in this delegation, there were religious leaders, some of whom were Christian, some of whom were Muslim. So there's this combination of people coming to see him. You have, you know, Chaldean Christians, you know, Chaldean Catholics, and then you have Muslims you know, like Sunni Muslims, and they're all there together. And, you know, when you have a group of people in front of you from different traditions, you might be confused as to who is who. So somebody's handing him a ornate book. He may think this is one of the Christian delegates handing him a gospel book. Um, I think that's a very likely possibility that, that somebody put a book in his face. He knew he was just talking to, the, you know, a, a patriarch a moment earlier it wouldn't be illogical to think that somebody was giving him a gospel book. Um, I think that's a very likely possibility, but we don't know for sure what he was thinking. He may have just been in the habit of, of, of kissing gifts because sometimes people believe that in Middle Eastern cultures, you receive a gift, gift, a gift by kissing it. Mm 
That isn't really true, but that's a belief that seems to be out there somewhere. He may have thought that was the proper thing to do was to kiss it. He may have been aware it was a Quran and he may have been kissing it just to show uh, gratitude without necessarily meaning he agreed with everything in it. Um, but again, we don't know his mind. He never answered a question mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. So all we can say is speculation. Would I say that he should be, you know, immediately excommunicated and apostatized for kissing a Quran? No, no. Um, like I said, he may not have been aware it was a Quran. And even if he was, he may have just been kissing it reflexively. Or, you know, he may have been trying to show respect for the elements of truth in it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. But wouldn't that give, again, the a, a wrong impression? You know, wouldn't it give people the impression that he's revering the fact that it denies that Jesus is the son of God? Yes, absolutely. That would give people the wrong impression. My suspicion is whatever happened there, he didn't think a whole lot before doing it. Mm -hmm. I think he was acting reflexively, whether or not he was aware of what the book actually was. Did, but like did I he, said, if, oh, if you ahead. attend Eastern liturgies and, you know, like you do, Michael, mm -hmm. books are put in people's faces all the time right? Mm -hmm. Gospel books all the time. Uh, you know, at the divine liturgy, at the great, at the little entrance, I come through and there's a whole line of altar boys and people there. And I, you know, I line up and they all, I put the gospel book in their faces and they all kiss it. Mm -hmm. Same thing after reading the gospel, people are kissing the gospel book. So if he's with a delegate delegation, there's a lot of Eastern Christians, uh, and he's familiar with their services. If you're in an Eastern Christian environment and somebody puts a book in your face, what you do is kiss it. Mm -hmm. That's probably what he was thinking. Did he ever come back and clarify, you know, hey, here's what happened. Here's, you know, what I intended, stuff like that. Not that I could find. And that seems to be an issue in and of itself, in, in my opinion. Um, because if he was ignorant of what it was, it would be helpful to come out and say that. And if he wasn't and he knew it was a Quran then it would be helpful to come out and say why he still did it, right? So either way, it seems like he should say something. Maybe, maybe not. You know, here's the thing. If you respond to your critics, <laughs> it's like feeding the troll. Sure. You know this all too well, I'm sure. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> and, and a lot of people take the position that they're just not going to respond to their critics. I get that. Um, and that may have been where he was coming from. I get that. I get that. But I would say, but in this case, for the sake of all the people who aren't his critics, who are confused. See, you know, I, I totally get not responding to the critics, but there's so many others who, who love John Paul II that were confused from this. And, and I think, well, for their sake, one should say something, not for, you know, maybe the critics. But then, then again, maybe let's say he did it by accident. He mm -hmm. didn't know what it was. Uh, Maybe in his mind, well, it happened. I can't undo it, mm -hmm. but maybe something good will come out of it, which was in the Muslim world, people interpreted this as him showing respect for Islam. Mm -hmm. And maybe he saw that as something positive that came out of it, even if it was unintentional. Mm -hmm. I think we cleared out the uh, questions there. Uh, did you have any concluding comments, anything that we missed there? Yeah, I, I do want to point something out here. Mm -hmm. So in the last video, we talked about the, uh, the Pachamama incident, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In this video, we talked about the Assisi situation. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, a major difference between the two events, which mm -hmm. was the Pachamama situation was a misinterpretation of Christians who were mm -hmm. praying. Right. So what we saw with the so-called Pachamama event um, were Catholic Christians from the Amazon praying to our God in a way that seems foreign to most people in the West. And mm -hmm. people assumed it was pagan or demonic. And the story began that it was an idol. Somebody gave her the name Pachamama. I'm not sure where they even came up with that because it was not Pachamama. I think a reporter used that term and it's kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. But in this situation here, these really were non-Christians. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to be, be aware of those kind of differences. Um, there are situations where there are non-Christians praying to non-Christian deities. And there are situations where there are Catholic Christians praying in a way that's Catholic, but unfamiliar to us. So we have to kind of be aware of which is which. Yeah, Carlos says um, he could have thought it was an Arabic gospel book. It's so obvious. I can't believe I didn't think of it before. I guess that shows my cultural ignorance and how I've been propagandized by pop narratives. I've, I've heard it before, too. Um 
I just it seems like there's just no evidence either way for what exactly it was and what he thought it was. Right. This is what I would say though is it looked if if I saw it in that context, I would immediately think it was a gospel book. Mm -hmm. That'd be my assumption because it looks just like a gospel book. Speaking of responding to critics, um, got another comment here. Reminds me of the dubia to Pope Francis on a more so tizia not responding to the trolls. You always have to worry about making it worse. Any any thoughts on that one? Yeah, yeah, you, you do have to be careful about that. Uh, my understanding is that after the Assisi incident, Pope John Paul II, or maybe it was the Vatican office, I forget, one of them issued some sort of statement to try and make things better. I think it was the Vatican office. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and people just took that and ran with it and tried to make it even worse than it was. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful about that. You have to be cautious about making the situations worse by responding. No, oh, that's interesting. I wasn't. I wasn't aware of the the um, you know follow up there. I, I, I could be mistaken on that, but I recall reading that somewhere. Mm -hmm. I could be mistaken though. There isn't a lot of evidence I could find on that, but I somewhere I did read that there was a response, and the response actually made it worse. I read that somewhere, but I. I have no more details on that, it, unfortunately. It's, it's certainly a true principle <laughs> that people can just take whatever and make it even worse. Oh, I've, I've so experienced that, you know. Um, <laughs> I've experienced that over the years. I used to work with EWTN, uh -huh. and one of the things I would do for them was I would answer theology questions online about Eastern Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I'd go on EWTN's website and answer these questions, and I'd get people who are very hostile and at first, I would try and respond to their accusations naively, thinking they had goodwill. But then it became apparent they didn't have goodwill. And my response would just make the whole worse. It would make the situation much, much worse. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, I learned to just stop responding to those people. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> Parker, by the way, uh -huh, that's ahead. why I'm careful about watching uh, the comments on these videos. Mm hmm because <clears throat> some of the comments we get on these videos, Michael, are, are, are downright, downright rancid, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, some of them are kind of humorous, but I don't respond to them generally. I know that the very first time I was on your show, Michael, um, I was talking about Eastern Catholicism, and an mm -hmm. Orthodox fellow said, his comment was simply this, this is the sad face of apostasy. Hmm. And my wife saw that, some of my friends saw that, and ever since then, uh, my nickname is the sad face of apostasy. So my, I promised my wife I'd smile tonight. <laughs> Hi, honey. That's funny. <laughs> but the, yeah, look, I, I, I see it nonstop. I see it nonstop. All of the comments that come through, I just see all kinds of outrageous comments so yeah i, I get it that parker says this is exactly why we'll never get clarification on the quran kissing moment nothing you could say would help anybody probably best everyone just forgets it happened charitably maybe so maybe so uh i think we grabbed everything from the chat so unless you had anything else we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up there yeah that, that was everything i'm looking forward to talking about the canada visit next month I am too. You pointed out you you pointed out to me privately some really interesting insights into that that I, I wasn't aware of. So I'm looking forward to us going over that. And then, um, of course, put in a plug for anything that you want to make the viewers aware of. Sure. Uh, please check out my website. It's east to west dot com. East the number two west dot com. I have uh, articles on there. I have some videos, all kinds of stuff. And also, I'm back with uh, Father Daniel Dozier. Father Michael Wynn and EWTN's Robert Klusko filming more episodes of Becoming Byzantine. We just filmed a special episode on Lent mm. in which we talk about the Byzantine understanding of Lent and some of our uh, Lenten spiritual practices and services. So uh, check that out. Go onto YouTube and type in Becoming Byzantine and you can check out our channel. Awesome. I'll put a link to that in the chat and thank I you. just put the website too as well. So I uh, got that in there. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. Very, very helpful. Truly appreciate it. My pleasure. I, I love this kind of stuff. It's fun. Everybody hit the like button and the subscribe button. And of course, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me. And one more time, again, if you want to get the free ebook that I just wrote, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you're confused about the crisis in the Catholic Church, go and get your free copy, reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a little pop-up. Click on it. You'll put in your email, and it will give you the PDF right then and there for free. All right, that's going to do it. Thank you all for watching. God bless.
If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.